Hey guys. We almost um, dropped you. We almost dropped you. We're getting ready to record the podcast. And here we go. <clears throat> I got a really nice message on Instagram, direct messages yesterday, saying that she had just found our podcast and was listening to it day after day and just loving it and hoping that one day her husband gets to a place where he's ready to also listen to the podcast. Awesome. So thank you, thank you. That's awesome, awesome. And that leads to talking about how to share the podcast effectively. Uh, it's kind of, our, our podcast is kind of unique um, because the topics we talk about are, are vulnerable and can trigger a lot of things. And also there's a lot of shame around the topic. So a lot of people are like, well, I don't wanna share it because I don't want people to think we're struggling or whatever. So how do you share it with your spouse? How do you share it with other people? Um, it, you know, I don't think it's effective to listen to one of our episodes and think, oh, that's awesome. That's what we need to learn. That's what we need to talk about. So you go shove it in your spouse's face and say, you got to listen to this. Right? Well, I, yeah, you I've need done this. that. <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, but, but I think you can approach it in a, in a way that's, that's really effective. You can say, you know what? I listened to this thing and it was amazing and I'd really appreciate it if you would too. I think it's pretty simple and you can be direct, um, but make it more about you. Like this really resonated with me and and I would really appreciate it if, if you'd listen, right? And some of those conversations that we had early on in recovery were some of the best because it built that um, intellectual, intellectual intimacy. Right. Just sharing things we've learned. It wasn't like, by the way, I heard this podcast and it was all about you. Right. We find ourselves in it instead. Right. I, I do think that, um, you know, if you have a spouse who's unwilling, who doesn't really want to listen, and <clears throat> is tired of you putting recovery stuff in front of their face all the time, and it's just a reminder to them that they're not enough, um, I think you can be a little bit subtle and a little bit careful. You know, we, we do little memes on our Facebook and little clips of our podcast, and maybe you can find some of those things that are quick and easy, rather than saying, hey, listen to this 30-minute podcast or whatever. And just to kind of, it, it's not a bad thing to nudge a little bit. Just nudge, um, but don't nudge in a way where it's like, look, I'm better than you. I have this figured out because I'm listening to this. But in a way that's like, hey, I'm learning, I'm growing, and I want to learn with you. I like that. So. Yeah. Because I was the, I'm better than you. But, but what's cool, though, is the nudge, if it comes from a place of like, uh, I have an aha, and it's, it's, like you guys said, it's about me. This is what I took away from this, and this is how it's, spinning in my head, that's different than saying, oh, I heard something that you need to listen to because it's about being honest, right. and you really need to listen to that. There's a different tone and a different feeling for each of those. Totally, totally. One more thing I want to say is, I heard a, a made-up st statistic this week that um, is completely made up, so <laughs> take it for what it's worth. 90% uh, of men look at porn, and the 10% that don't lie about it. You know, we, and, and, and what they're saying is, look, like, most men out there are looking at porn. Normalizing it, or? Yeah, and, 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 well, no, the statistic was saying, look, it's a big problem, Okay. right? And what that means to me is, you know, when it comes to sharing the podcast, uh, we know the nature of this addiction. Part of it is that you feel isolated and alone in your shame. Um, and, and every time that I've seen somebody open up and share their story a little bit, even by maybe just sharing the podcast and like, you know a, a buddy who might be struggling a little bit and it's like this one episode you know would help him, but you gotta face your own shame because he might think something about you. Um, face that shame and understand that if you reach out and you show him a little part of you, you'll be creating some, some connection and some love with him, but you're gonna have to overcome your shame a little bit to share our podcast sometimes. Well, and right? Brandon, you've talked about this before. You can't just all of a sudden be shame resilient. It's those little tiny baby steps that are like, okay, I'm gonna practice. Exactly. I'm do it a little bit more. And exactly. it's that it takes courage. I was talking to a guy just the other day, and he's he was, nobody really knows about his story and his family, and nobody except his wife. And I was kind of saying like, look, you're still living in secrecy a little bit. And you know, you don't have to be the poster child here, but bust, bust out a little bit. And I was joking with him, I was like, look, I'm, I'm doing a presentation in two weeks. You can come share your story if you want. And he's like, ha ha. He's like, no, I'm coming. Oh, I'm wow. Coming. Yeah. 
And he's like, I'm coming, and then I'm going to call my parents, and I'm going to tell them what I shared that day. Aww, and I was like, that's awesome. Yes, awesome. Like, face the, face the shame a little bit, practice the courage, and, and he's going to do some good for the world. Absolutely. So, um, okay, on to the topic of the day. Um, we're, we're talking about anxiety and addiction and anxiety and betrayal. So, um, Kobe, you have some personal experience with it. Mm -hmm. Why don't we start there and just walk us through what, how that has really been a part of your recovery, how it's contributed to your addiction. Mm -hmm. Just kind of tell us your story with, when it comes to anxiety. Well, it's interesting because I would never, let's see, I was diagnosed with anxiety, what, Ashton, probably two months ago? Maybe two, three? Three. Three. And that was a really, um, it was a really weird experience for me because I never, like, like let me just kind of set the stage. Genetically, my family on both sides is predisposed to anxiety and depression, just mental health issues, right? It runs in my family like blue eyes. And, but I had never dealt with that before. At least I could never identify it. And... Um, all of a sudden in, when was it like August, September, I got into this place where my heart would race and it felt like, it felt like I had this, this like eight inch cylinder in my chest. This is the only way I can describe it. That would spin faster and faster and faster. And I couldn't. I would I, I could not slow it down. It was like out of like that physical response was out of my control And it was a really strange thing and then it would like snatch my breath sometimes and I remember we had we were having some two two <laughs> two um, Friends come over for dinner one night and I was smoking ribs and it'd been like a totally normal day and right, right before they came. How can you have anxiety when you're smoking ribs? I know, you know? right? Yeah. Totally. It's like this beautiful five-hour process of <laughs> creation of, of like extreme yumminess. But <laughs> but the weird thing is, I remember walking inside and telling Ashlyn, like, Ashlyn, I can't, I don't know what's going on, but I can't slow down. Like, I can't slow this down. And I feel like my body is out of my control. And it was a super strange thing. And I can't pinpoint one thing looking back, that was the cause of that. Right. And it that's, was a super that's, weird I think, thing. What has been the most frustrating is with recovery, we've been able to, you know, back it up and say, okay, like, this is a trigger for you, and this is where we can create some boundaries here and things like that. And with, yeah. with this, we haven't quite figured... And, and that, that, that was where, where does it come from and yeah. why totally yeah because I've been able to identify self-destructive behavior self-sabotaging behavior and what are the causes of those things like in in a really effective manner to help mitigate the self-destructive behavior because I've been able to find its origins but in this it was just so weird and I think that was probably the most perplexing if I'm thinking about from your perspective Ashley that was probably the hardest thing for you to wrap your head around and it was really hard for me to just in a sentence say I don't know where this is coming from and have you actually accept that yeah it, yeah and it when I wasn't accepting and I was trying to find solutions and trying to understand it only made him feel more yeah, I was like dude wait like just allow me to feel this and tell me I'm not crazy and make me feel normal because I don't feel normal right yeah. so that was a really challenging thing and what's really interesting is Ashlyn we finally I finally made an appointment to go see the doctor and I made certain that Ashlyn went with me because I was really, really scared about just speaking this, but I was to the point where it's like, I can't handle this anymore, I've got to go see the doctor. And I remember sitting in the office with the, with the doctor, and Ashley was right, right by my side, and I was just thinking like, I would so much rather talk about my looking at porn and masturbating for like 31 years than, than actually saying out loud, I have anxiety. And I've dealt with some, some, some suicidal th thoughts and some depression. So Spike hangs out around your anxiety. Like legit. Yeah, there's Le a lot of shame there. It was well, and intense. He's, he's not alone. I've heard yeah. it from multiple people that it is one of this, the hardest things to accept. It's like the addiction you maybe created. Right. But this is your brain. It's your mental health. It's maybe genetic or something like that. And it's frustrating. You feel broken. And but also, like, what's the perception of, of a mentally ill person right? in yeah. our society? A yeah. crazy person, a dangerous person, uh, you know? 
So there's a ton of shame around around mental illness. It's right? like, wait, is this my on ramp to you know living in a van down by the river? Is this like, is this my on ramp to like total self destruction? Well, or leaping out of control. Let's be more honest. When we started talking to a doctor and talking about medications, it was a huge topic of is this what are our non addictive right. options here? Because we already have someone who's in recovery from addiction. We don't want to right. bring on another. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because the idea was is like, okay, you need to take a medication to help deal with this overall. And the expectation is is this is gonna be like a one to two year process to help your body um, kind of reboot itself so that you're producing the necessary chemicals that are not being produced right now. And I was like, okay, I can accept that. But then what I figured out was is that even though I was taking that, there were still moments when I would have like heightened anxiety. And I was like, wait. So it wasn't like this overall, it, it was just, I would have pronounced moments of anxiety in, in like specific moments. Again, could not identify why they just would manifest. And so that was hard. So we started to take like, I didn't want to go down the road of, of like, I don't know, like immediately taking a benzo like for that. And as much as that's a common practice for people, I'm not calling heads or tails on benzos because even with the doctor described, it's like some people, this is like the most effective treatment for them. And that's just how it is. Right. But it was very, it was, it was my, my mom died in part of pneumonia and barbiturate abuse. I had a brother who spent like was arrested five times and sent to jail. And the sixth time he was arrested, he went to prison because of drugs. Right. And so taking a benzo is not like the first thing you want to do. Right. That we, makes it's, sense. It's our personal stuff shining through. Totally. Right. And pain pills. But, but that's also smart on your part. Well, right? I mean, I don't know. Pain pills were, were a thing for me. They, they never were a thing for me before because I had taken them for various like shoulder surgeries and so forth. And they make me sick, which is good. But I'm just like super, super aware and heightened my sensitivity to those things because of the genetic makeup in my family, right? And our personal experiences with that, um, with my mom and my brother. So it was, it was just, I'm actually feeling some, it's, it, I'm actually feeling some, some anxiety now just describing it and talking about it to the extent of sometimes it's harder to capture a full breath. And yeah. that's kind of how it manifests. So, so let's talk. Me. Let's talk. Let's break down anxiety a little further okay. because there, it's actually a big spectrum. It's, um, you know, when we just say anxiety, well, what is that? Um, people experience anxiety differently. Um, you know, I might wake up one day and just feel a, a strong sense of urgency, like I've got to get something done, and I'm feeling some level of anxiety there. Um, then there's the person who locks himself in the bathroom and cleans every germ they possibly can and doesn't leave all day long because of their OCD, which is anxiety, right? And so it's, it's, there's different things going on there, but what is anxiety? Um, anxiety underneath all of it is fear. And I, I believe um, anxiety is emotions that haven't been dealt with, that have built up and built up and built up. And um, over time, as they build up, eventually they come out. I believe that emotions are alive and they come out. The body keeps the score. Yeah. Feelings buried alive never die. There's a great book called that, where the body keeps the score. And so you're sitting there smoking ribs. Well, maybe you haven't dealt with some, some, some pain or fear or sadness in your relationship. Mm -hmm. Maybe you're feeling inadequacy and shame about your career. Maybe you're, so, so whatever it is, like these things are piled on top of each other and they're just ruminating in there mm -hmm. and ruminating in there. And the next thing you know, you're, you got shortness of breath, your skin's crawling, the panic attack starts to, to Which I had in. those. That was what we ha I had that night when I was smoking ribs. Right, the body does keep the score and the body says, oh my gosh, there's things here that you have not dealt with. And that's the part that scared me, because right. we believe the same thing. Right. But what, what, what do you mean when it scared you? It scared me because it was the, we do a nightly check-in with emotions, right? So we're naming 50 emotions a day. And I think that's a super important piece to keep in mind on this, is that Ashley had been in this practice for probably a month before I actually was diagnosed and started feeling anxiety of sharing our emotions. I think that's a key point on this. Keep going. Okay. And so it was the, what are you not sharing with me? What do I not know? What it is goes, inside that you're not dealing with? It went back right? to the triggers of, this was how we lived in all those years before with addiction. Right. Like, what are you hiding? And the thing yeah. is, Kobe, you might, you might not even know, 
right? Oh, I still. I, I can totally yeah. see your trigger, Ashlyn. Like, oh my gosh, what? He's not dealing with his emotions, and now he's shutting down. And you're just kind of bumping along, trying to live life the way you do, but it's built up now, and now it's spilling up, spilling over, mm -hmm. right? Um, a dual diagnosis, addiction and anxiety, or addiction and depression. Uh, um, I see it almost every time I work with an addict, whether it's a drug addict or sex addict. Huh. And the reason is, is because what the, what the addiction is doing is it's, it's avoiding coping with emotion. It's avoiding going through the process of surrendering over an emotion. An addict doesn't want to feel pain. And those emotions oftentimes are vulnerable and painful and, and they don't want to step into that. They don't want to like really process it and learn from it. They just don't want to feel it. Mm -hmm. So as they numb it, it just goes in their bank. It goes inside of them. Like, okay, I, you know, I'm, I'm angry at my wife, so I drank a beer and looked at porn. Okay, now we haven't talked about it since. Now it's just inside of me. Mm -hmm. And then I'm stressed, I'm stressed at work, and I don't want to deal with my boss. So, you know what, forget it. I'm just going to act out. Well, now that's just inside of me. And those things add up and add up and add up until they start to spill out. And a huge part of recovery, that really relapse prevention, is learning how to tolerate the pain mm -hmm. and walk through that emotion so that, so that you don't have all this buildup inside of you over and over again. See, but this is where I get so confused because, and Kobe's like, hey, I'm in this conversation. I, um, I don't. I just I know. Because let me just say this. I hated this conversation when it first started happening because okay. I was like, dude, you're like totally accusing me or I was feeling accused. But what I'm also realizing now is that you're connecting your own dots, which is something that you're totally entitled to do. But more importantly, I need you to be able to connect the dots here so that you understand and can be empathetic and supportive. Now I don't know what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on. I'm sorry. <laughs> When you, when you come back to those dots, I, I want to know. Okay. So, so maybe on our, our deep dive Patreon episode, we can talk about um, what it looks like to actually work through a, a fear, work through an emotion, so you can get on the other side of it, um, so that it doesn't just sit inside of you. Yeah. Um, okay, I remember. Okay. Um, you can stop here. So, Kobe's one of the most mindful people that I know. Okay. He's become such because of recovery, right? Let me just tell you, it's not always been that way. I was like the most mindless No, he was super mindless. <laughs> and so this is where it was like, you're so mindful. How do you not like not recognize know. what's going on that's causing your body to react out of control? Yeah. And you don't have control, right? That's the part. But, and this is where anxiety really becomes problematic because um, it, it sometimes mindfulness takes a, a rewind where okay, you start having the physical symptoms, and so you're like, okay, let me stop here and really check out what's going on with me. But what's the, what's the problem with anxiety is when, when you start to have those physical symptoms, you're in your limbic system, you're in your emotional mind. And so your emotional mind isn't saying stop and get logical and get rational here and totally. really delve into what's actually going on. Your emotional mind perpetuates itself, it grows, gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and that's where panic attacks start to happen. And if you, can, if you can have tools to learn how to bring it back to your rational mind, bring it back to, to, to reason and to mindfulness, you can start to subdue the anxiety and not let it build on itself, mm -hmm. right? But, but that's a skill, it, it takes practice, and it takes learning how to, how to be mindful in order to start to control that anxiety. Mm. And, and it takes some work. You, you, you got to work your brain out so that you can do that. Or else the anxiety is just going to take its course. And, and, and I think what's important to describe is when you say anxiety can take its course, especially when we're talking about addiction and the ripples on the betray with betrayal, what, what are the things that you've seen that this looks like when you said it plays out? Um, you mean for the, the effect uh, of anxiety on the addicted and then what the ripple effects are for the betrayed. Yeah, I mean, so uh, we, we've kind of heard it here today with you guys. Ashton, you're talking about your triggers because of his anxiety. And so, it, you know, you, you both start to resonate in fear and anxiety because it's just like it's building inside of you, then it's building all around you as well, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, 
so but but when it takes its course it, it can it can end up in a bunch of different places you could end up in the ER because you think you're having a heart attack because you're having a panic attack it can end up in complete isolation and numb out and and just go into your drug of choice because you can't handle it mm. right um, it, it can end up in a lot it can end up in a lot of control you go to the betrayed and you start trying to control her and this and that because because you're, I'm feeling internally out of control. Because you're feeling out of control, so you okay. want to control something. Mm -hmm. And I could go on and on on the different ways in which it, it plays out. Um, but and, and it's really good to get mindful of, if you have anxiety, how does it play out for you? I clean. So you clean? <laughs> I'm not like crazy cleaner, but I just get organized. I need control somewhere. So you feel, and, yeah. and, and maybe that's a healthy coping thing, yeah. or maybe it is, it's, it's healthier not. It's healthier than coping yeah. self. Healthier than an alternative that's been present <laughs> The lion's share of my life. <laughs> but 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 the question, Ashton, is are you doing it mindfully? Sometimes no, in or are you just for sure. You're right. I was like angry. Angry cleaning. Cleaning's a is is a catch twenty two with Ashlyn. <laughs> I am not angry anymore. <laughs> You're not angry anymore. You're not in betrayal when you clean. But you, you clean like real aggressive cleaning for you came from observing your mom aggressively clean. And yeah. so when you clean, sometimes it's like this, um, you're working through like shame and being out of control. So it, sometimes it can be like an emotionally charged, like impatient place. I'm not trying sounds to like, Sounds like anxiety. Like, yeah. So you want to see my anxiety? Yeah. yeah that's, so, my that fingernails. Was my I have no fingernails. Yeah. Because I just rip them and whatever mm -hmm. when I feel anxiety. So that's how it's taken my taken its course with me. Yeah. Um, let, let's shift a little bit and, and okay. talk about anxiety with the betrayed. Um, I, I will say 100% of the time, the women who who I've worked with, who have experienced betrayal trauma, suffer from some level of anxiety, and um, some worse than others. Um, and, and that's, it, when we talk about the fear cycle um, with betrayal trauma, that's what that is. You're getting caught up in anxiety about having some control in your life, and that fear is not being dealt with, so you have more fear, and it's feeding itself, and you're, you're feeling anxiety. So a lot of the women I work with have insomnia, they have panic attacks, they exhibit symptoms of OCD, um, or they just ruminate in their thoughts about where their husband is and what's going on in their marriage. Um, but I, I almost see it across the board when I work with betrayal trauma that there's anxiety there. Ashton, what, what has been your experience with it? Uh, mine has been a little, well, a lot different than Kobe's because um, it's not as pronounced. I guess I didn't realize I was feeling anxiety for a long time because I just thought, like, I just, this, these are the things that I do when I'm in fear. Okay. Right? Mm -hmm. And so now I'm realizing, like, okay, so it was, like, inadequacies, um, feeling not enough, feeling scared. That, so when you're in fear, your shame buddies up with oh, that fear for sure. and starts to add to your emotional mind. Yeah. Right? And Spike, Spike takes that and makes mountains. Um, yeah, I make up stories. Um, it's like that broken record in my head. Good um, sign of anxiety. Assumptions, making up stories. Oh, I'm like, super good at you, it. Your, your fear is trying to beat beat it to the punch, right? It's trying to figure it out and know what's happening yeah. before it, it gets you mindless. So, yeah. Okay, so it sounds like maybe a low level of anxiety. Yeah. Never had major panic attacks no. or... And I never have felt like my daughter gets stomach aches, she gets headaches, you know, Kobe has the cylinder, short of breath. I didn't have any of those things. It really was the, my head. I just would get lost in my head okay. and then act in like, okay, I'm going to clean or I'm going to go read. I'm going to go to something. Right. Get me out of here. I don't right. want to be in my head. Right. Um, I, I want to give just my opinion on medication. Um, I, I think medication can be really helpful. Um, for the at the right time, and sometimes I think it's overused. I think it's a crutch, and and people get stuck on it, and they don't learn how to really learn the healthy coping skills for these emotions. Um, but sometimes I think it's absolutely necessary when a person's in a in a state of um, panic, um, when they don't know how to control their anxiety. What I would what I would recommend, and this is me coming from a place of I'm a therapist. Um, that I sit down with people every day. I don't prescribe medication and we talk about healthy coping mechanisms and tools and I would say get your self-care in order um, That will help tremendously Get sleep exercise exercise is so good for anxiety and depression 
um, eat well, and all the things we always talk about. One thing that helps me is speaking it. So it's that shame, like speak this, speak that I'm feeling anxious, speak the feelings and inadequacies that I'm having. I still do it today. Fear dies when you face it. Yeah. And, and so when you, when you talk about it, when you speak it, it starts to go away. If you turn to Ashley and said, oh my gosh, I'm feeling anxiety. Mm -hmm. I need to breathe right now. Dude, I actually right? do that. And that's, I, I had to learn how to do that because it was like, uh, like, but, but here's what's interesting is I really hit this wall of fear of saying it and speaking it. But once Ashley was in the doctor's office and I said it to Ashlyn um, and, the, and the doctor, it was like, okay, now that's there. And I knew that every time I felt it thereafter, the, I needed to view Ashlyn as the person who was going to help me. So I would say, hey, I'm feeling anxiety. And I've been pretty regular, I think, at, at sharing that with you. And that was hard at first, but what I'm realizing is, is that you're really just there to help me. And so that's the, the help is just like looking at me and saying, I'm sorry, and giving me a hug. One thing about it is it's not helpful to get anxious about your anxiety. But that's a thing, and that's happened to me. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm having anxiety and I shouldn't. Yeah, yeah. I sh it's bad. It's yeah. not bad that you're having anxiety. If you can turn and accept it, you face it. Okay, there's that trigger. My gut's starting to feel this way. My shortness of breath. I'm having anxiety. I own that. I see yeah. that. Now I'm going to talk to someone about it. I'm going to use some tools that I've learned, uh, you know, to, to get mindful, I'm to slow things about down. It. Just <laughs> say it and right. Just tell the world. Um, yeah. But if you can't face it and can't own it, then you're not going to do a very good job of coping with it. So. But it does. It does help saying that. And I actually said it a few minutes ago, but just saying it helps, which is, which is weird. And, but the parallel between like saying I'm tempted or saying like I've relapsed of, of disclosing this thing that eats, can eat you from the inside out. It, the principle is still true. Right. If you speak it, it helps reduce the intensity of the emotions you're feeling. Sometimes, but sometimes it doesn't and it, it can help. And, okay, and I that's just a want, fair statement, for, actually. for our audience, I want them to understand that you know, you can try it and maybe it won't work. Uh -huh. uh, you speak it and then you feel it even more, right? So try some other tools. And that has happened to me too, actually. Remove yourself from the situation. Go try to just breathe. Um, go do something where you, you actually feel um, so, like something. Go rub something soft. Uh, hold something comforting for you. Um, whatever, whatever tool there is. I'm not a total expert on anxiety, but there are things that you can do to get out of your limbic system get into your neocortex, your frontal lobe, and start to slow that anxiety down. So, so. it's kind of interesting because you said, go hold something, go, we got a dog. <laughs> it's coming Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> that that will give you a lot of anxiety <laughs> and be a great it's tool to both. reduce anxiety. It's gonna give yeah. me more anxiety. Yeah. But, but that's really the end goal of having this dog is to help our daughters with anxiety and help Kobe. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But yeah. we, we all know in the Mitchell household it's gonna that disrupt. Ashlyn's gonna love the little dog. Yeah. 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 No, and with after the disruption of our life. Yes. So get ready for it. <laughs> okay. So um, there are very specific things that I evaluated and thought through from my environment that helped me to deal with this, and there were a number of um, considerations. And again, that that, that we that we looked at to help alleviate some of the stress. So we're gonna, uh, so in the, in the Patreon episode, we're gonna talk about maybe some environmental factors to consider, some situational triggers to consider that could be um, adding to anxiety, or at least I'll share mine, and that may or may not be effective for those who are listening. But I'm gonna share some best practices that I've used to help deal with this, and um, and then we can talk about you know some simple things that Ashlyn's done. But, um, but I think the real key to remember on this is, is guys, um, as far as the, the, the podcast is here, and what's really cool about this particular platform for all of you who are listening is you can listen completely anonymously. Like subscribe this is, yeah, anonymously. Subscribe, okay. and, and there's no feed that tells people who follow you or who are your friends that you're actually listening to us or that you subscribe to us. And that's one of the beauties of the, the podcast, okay? So Patreon is the same thing where you can you can be enveloped in this blanket of anonymity and you you don't have to announce who you are. I like, you what, I like what you said. You can put your name as Captain Underpants. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> if you want to be Johnny Lunchbucket, you know what I mean? Right. Then that can be your thing. If you want to put Cheeto Lover, then you can do that as well. So it can be totally anonymous. 
You don't yeah. have to use a picture of yourself. You can just be there completely anonymously and you can just you can just drink in and um, allow the content to soak in. And ask the questions. We have people who are yeah. both, who are not afraid and then some who are like, let's stay anonymous and we sure. love you both. <laughs> For sure. Absolutely. So um, we're gonna we're gonna post a podcast episode, or not a podcast, but we're a, a, a podcast deep dive on this specific episode of the uh, the podcast there. So I want to invite you guys to come and join us because um, there'll be some really good content there. So guys, thanks for listening. Um, and um, go ahead and, and uh, leave a review. Love to have you rate us as well. Also Nights anonymous. Ins- also can be done anonymously as well. And then, and then go share us, not anonymously. <laughs> yeah. Right? <laughs> All right, guys, All right, thanks for guys. being here.